In 2002, the Australian Federal Treasurer, Peter Costello, commissioned the Australian Treasury to look at the long-term issues facing the nation and how adequately current generations were preparing for future ones. It was an eye-opening. I'll re- quote from the report. The message was stark and shocking. However well the government was managing the issues of the day, Australia's ageing population would put immense stress on public finances, especially on health and aged care spending over the next four decades. Total government spending would exceed revenue within 15 years, and by 2041, those demands would strip the equivalent of 5% from annual GDP. Well, as always, if you spend more than you're earning, you have a difficult road ahead. There were no easy solutions. Immigration levels were increased. In fact, Peter Costello famously encouraged Australians to have more children with his slogan, come on Australians, one for mum, one for dad, and one for the country. So here we are. You are sitting in Melbourne. I'm here in London, 10,000 miles away. I think you're the furthest guest to have appeared on the Money Maze podcast. So delighted to talk to a very different sovereign wealth fund today. So Ben Samil, the Deputy CIO at the Australia Future Fund, welcome to the Money Maze podcast. Yeah, thank you, Simon. Pleasure to be here. Well, look, um, we have much to talk about, and uh, it's the end of your day. It's the beginning of mine. Um, you just told me you've actually already had supper, and I've had breakfast, and uh, I think uh, we're always worried about the communications, but uh, absolutely beautiful broadband for the moment that seems to be uh, you know, uh, helping us. I, um, I talked about the problem that was identified, but starting high level, what was the solution? Yeah, so I think they they tossed around a couple of solutions. And, uh, you know, I would say that it's kind of quaint given the state of global government finances now that they were desperately worried about, you know, perhaps overspending in 20, 30 years' time. Um, but uh, the, the, they, they tossed around a few solutions. And um, one was to shut down. There was no debt. So there was no government debt at all, and they had no need to borrow. And so one was to shut down the Commonwealth um, government bond market. And that that received some support, although the people at um, the AOFM and in Treasury obviously had a reaction to that. <laughs> Losing a sovereign curve wasn't thought as the best idea, perhaps. So fortunately, that one was yelled down. Um, and then the second and most obvious one was to use the funds to, for, say, election largesse. Um, and that would have, I think, been the most tempting one. And I'm sure that uh, our chairman now and the treasurer then, um, uh, Mr. Costello, had to push back fairly hard against the temptation for, you know, the use of those funds to improve electoral chances. Um, they decided not to, and they instead they decided to invest the surplus, uh, which was our last surplus, of course, in the um, – in a, in a sovereign wealth fund, a savings, essentially a savings fund, which was a consideration of intergenerational equity. Yes, of course, for those of us who go back a long way, um, I, well, what amazed me was that Australia was running into these surpluses where forever Australia was like Britain, which was a weak currency deficit running the new country. And yet Australia got itself into this you know, remarkably fortunate position. So before we talk about the AF, how did your own journey lead you into the Australia Future Fund? I grew up solidly, I don't know, lower middle class and uh, was obsessed with, uh, like most people, obsessed with the local uh, local sport. And, and I knew that I was very much not good at the things that the people around me were good at. So they were very strong and they tended to fix things. And I had no idea how to do any of that. And I thought, my goodness, I'm never going to be able to, you know, be useful in any tiny way. Um, so I ended up getting very interested in history and psychology and going to university and studying that. And I thought for sure that that's what I'd do with my life. And, uh, I had planned on becoming, uh, something called a cognitive neuropsychologist. Um, and my journey was relatively well set. Um, and then I got waylaid by, uh, my mum got very unwell and I had to look after her. And essentially by the time I got back to study, to do my post um, grad, I was sort of out of options. I was out of I was out of supervisors, and the only two supervisors I could access 
at the University of Melbourne Psychology Department at the time was um, someone who was very interested in the psychology of music, and I was not very interested in the psychology of music, and another person who was this incredibly intimidating polymath who had gone to Caltech at the age of 15 and had the highest measured IQ in Australia at that time, um, and he had lots of interest. But one of those happened to be behavioral finance. And so I took the behavioral finance piece and I, and I cobbled together over the next year sort of a mud map of how markets work based on some sort of uh, agent-based modeling. And, and he asked me to stay on and become a research fellow at the university, which I did. And then uh, I paid my way through in various ways, one of which by being a, a recruiter for a local professional sporting team. And that that event that work eventually got recognized by a significant investor in the US, and that became a hedge fund, which I uh, led the research on for about nine years, and then decided that... Uh, Whilst that was absolutely fascinating, it was kind of an upside down life to go straight into a hedge fund without sort of the broader experience of investment bank consulting, you know, asset management, whatever most people do. Um, did my master's in applied finance and went to an, a local asset owner, a super fund, thinking that was exactly the same as working at a hedge fund, which of course it was a very different skill. Um, <laughs> and I learned that and eventually became the head of investment strategy there and then um, and then came over to join the hedge fund program at the Australian Future Fund. Um, I think what was that 2014, so I'm in my tenth year now. Great. Well, that's a very, very interesting journey and unexpected one. We have not had anybody who even, as far as I know, has attempted cognitive uh, neuroscience. Although, as we said in our earlier chat, Nikolai Tangen from the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund is experimenting with all sorts of things. And I think he actually talked about sort of, you know, that some of that aspects related to that. Um, let's just, if I can ask you, summarize the AFF as it is today. I think you're a $250 billion institution, but just give us a sense of scale, size, numbers, locations? Yeah, so um, 250 billion, give or take on the day, primarily run one. Uh, so we, we have a series of mandates that the biggest pot of money is the is the future fund itself, um, which is approximately 200 billion of the 250. And then we run a series of other funds, client funds. Um, so some of those are for medical research, indigenous land, um, it, and and various other things. It's Melbourne and Sydney, but prim primarily Melbourne. Um, and there's roughly, actually, I, I haven't counted everyone re recently, but but call it 350 permanent employees, around 75 of those at in, at the, in the investment team. There's a few unusual things about it. Um, unlike most of our peers these days, including, say, the Canadian model, um, it's it's a purely outsourced model. There's no internal asset management, as it were, although uh, if you're interested, there are some some things which get close to that, but we, we don't run our own internal equities program or our own internal hedge fund program or anything like that. And we've, from day one, really been very focused on on this thing that, that we call being joined up, this sort of joined up investing, one, one portfolio, one purpose, we call it now. And we, I can describe that, but... But the, it, it's different. It, it, it's always been different. It was very new at the time. Lots of people now call that total portfolio investing. I think it's becoming more popular, although we would say that's actually a different thing to what we do. Well, we are going to come back to that, but I want to start at this the high point, uh, uh, which is the investment aim, because it's quite striking. Every institution has a different sort of, you know, approach, but yours is to achieve long-term investment returns of four and a half to five percent per annum above inflation, if I'm right, which is, you know, I think particularly in a country like Australia, you know, quite a, quite a demanding return. And I think it was, again, Peter Costello who said, we're not here to fund road construction in Taree, we're here to get a financial return. So how do you collectively think about that investment objective? <laughs> yeah, he, he did say that. So um, look, the way we think about it, 
Well, I should say that right now, the way we think about it is it looks incredibly hard because obviously our benchmark is screaming away from us. Um, and we make money by investing in fi in financial assets and, and they have obviously um, not done quite so well over the last year. But we have achieved that from inception since 2007. Um, so our long-term returns have more or less met our objective. We think that's going to be harder going forward, like much harder for all the obvious reasons that we're living in the here and now and that we saw through last year, but but also because we think we've moved into a you know a, a different paradigm, a different world. The, the, the tailwinds that were allowed us to generate these CPI plus four and a half to five returns over the last decade, we feel are becoming at least not tailwinds and in many cases headwinds, which should just make our job quite significantly harder. It'll definitely create opportunities, really interesting opportunities. I think it creates an opportunity for a more interesting life, frankly, and a more interesting investment experience and a more interesting job and and to create more value, which is really purposeful. So I, I know I'm quite excited about it. Maybe I'm masochistic because we get all get paid on on meeting that objective. Um, but you know, I think for a, a long time um, over the previous paradigm, one could have closed their eyes and just as long as you were invested, it almost didn't matter what you're invested in. The view had this giant beta tailwind, which took you to a reasonable return outcome while your benchmark actually kept on getting lower. Um, we're in a different place now, so so we feel like we have to work a lot harder. Well, I think that's candid, and of course, I'm going to agree with you because that's my view as well, but, uh, you know, a tougher landscape ahead. Now, as we get down into the portfolio approach, um, one of the things that an earlier CEO of yours, David Neal, had said is that many institutional investors arbitrarily fill predetermined asset class buckets with too many average quality assets in the name of diversification, risk management at its worst. And I thought it was quite interesting because I've seen lots of different investment approaches and there is there is a lot of that that goes on. We've got our strategic asset allocation, we have our silos, how do we populate them? You've mentioned this total portfolio approach. Just talk me through how you guys have gone about it. Yeah, but Dave was at the genesis of this very much. He also famously, maybe it's not famous, famous to me. I, I, I was in the audience, so I remember it well. But he also said, we don't need to curl up in bed sucking on the corner of a benchmark. We should be better than that. Um, and so uh, that that resonated strongly with me, and I thought I want to work there. So what that means, so my current CIO, CIO CEO, CIO, Raf, um he has a way of describing this joined up approach of ours, which is essentially he he shows a a slide which has the 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 top down view, the bottom up view, and then this sort of cartoon cloud in the middle with arms and legs all coming out of it, you know, demonstrating collaboration <laughs> or a giant fight in the middle. Um, and uh, and essentially that that was the genesis. So it was a very small investment team. They didn't think they'd ever need to have more than thirty people. Um, everyone was kind of all the senior people were essentially in the same room making the decisions together. And the idea was that you would have a competition for capital. So it's a competition for ideas. So there were there was a blank sheet, but there was always a blank sheet, or the concept of a blank sheet. Let's look at this as if it were a blank sheet. And very importantly, what that meant, which is hard because finance doesn't tend to work like this anywhere else, is that you had to understand the total portfolio, everything that's in it, how it interacted, all the different dynamics of of risk. So be it, you know, return, volatility, yes, currency, absolutely, which is actually hard for a lot of people, duration liquidity very importantly as well um, and everything else in between you know geography and so you had to understand all of that and then you had to build your this total portfolio you had to build the whole thing which is very different from saying you're a property manager you're a hedge fund manager you're an equity manager go and build the best portfolio that you can build so I know so I ran the alternate the hedge fund program for for some time, for example, and you know, and I populated that in a way 
that was a long, 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 long way away from how I would have run it if I was asked to just run a hedge fund portfolio and get CPI plus four. I would have had a lot more risk-seeking things. I would have had a lot less long vol things. Um, I would have sized things completely differently. And I would have, you know, I would have taken on a lot less liquidity. I would have taken on more illiquidity because that would have suited me. But when there's a whole bunch of assets that I can invest in that are illiquid, um, you know, quite possibly the best use of that illiquidity budget is not in my portfolio. I should perhaps be providing liquidity in an emergency so that we can invest in assets somewhere else. And so one has to understand that and really embrace it and really trust everyone in that room that they're going to be supported if they go for years and years generating very low returns, say, in the environment that's very strong in the knowledge that at some point that will that will turn upside down and that's good for the total portfolio. And there's examples of that in every asset class. So that's a much harder model than you've got $4 billion or you've got this much VAR or you've got this much risk, go and do the best you can. And often then a total portfolio approach, what people call a total portfolio approach will be, go and do that and we'll fix it in the middle, you know, with overlays and whatnot. So we have an overlays program, but it's also integrated into that. And so, so that, that was the genesis and that's absolutely how it worked and how it still works. But of course, it works much easier like that with 20 people and $50 billion. It's much harder to do that with $250 billion and 350 people. But we work very hard at maintaining that culture because we believe that's a really important part of our edge and the way we add value. It's also why we're predominantly in Melbourne and Sydney and we haven't taken on global offices because we believe that information dissemination collaboration is actually the secret source to you know our relative success. Uh, that's interesting. And also you are outsourcing. So the boots on the ground in foreign countries, I guess, has a different you know dynamic to those that are trying to do it in those countries. But the thing that stood out as I went through the portfolio and the transactions of the past was concentration. And I noted that it, now this was back after the GFC is that uh, you bought over 200 million pounds worth of commercial real estate in the UK, the bull ring when British land was being forced to divest. So again, concentration, risk, they, 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 they merge in people's minds. How do you as a, as a group and as a, as a deputy CIO think about that concentration? Yeah, we think of it in all the traditional ways so that everyone looks at, you know, the, um, potential downside, maximum loss, volatility, all those things, obviously, just the same as everyone does. Um, but ultimately, the role of the investment committee is to also say, apropos of, of this sort of joined up culture, if you if, essentially, if this is such a good idea, why are we only doing this much of it? So if, you know, my property head comes and says, look, I think this is an amazing idea. You know, I think they're throwing this out. The, you know, my expected return here is whatever, pick a number. And it's really low risk for all of these reasons. And they can convince the investment committee of that. What will they will then frequently do is say, and so within my portfolio, I think this makes sense at, you know, pick a number. 3% of my portfolio, 6% of my portfolio, whatever it is. But it's not their portfolio and we don't care about, they're not running a portfolio. They have a series of assets which go into the total portfolio. And so 3% or 6% or 10% of my property portfolio is not going to move the needle at the total portfolio level. And if this is an incredibly compelling investment, then we should do as much of it as we can because we can bear that at the total portfolio. So that the conversations look more like that than this makes sense in a you know, isolated sub-portfolio way. We really try to steer ourselves miles away from that conversation and we incentivize away from that as well. And do you think that unlike the Calsters and the Ontario teachers that have this fixed liability and, you know, a challenge with that sort of every year, it's giving you more room to to take that, you know, that, that, that longer term view? I think so. And, you know, we've been in, to your point, we've been in the semi-luxurious situation of, not having outflows since we since we started, and so we were able to yeah to look over the horizon. Um, we also don't have inflows, and we're an Australian dollar investor, so we do have to be 
extremely cautious about the U- the recent UK experience, you know, being um, a wonderful example. You know, we do have to be careful about our liquidity management and not just penny our ears back and assuming that will always be okay. We have a very pro-cyclical currency. We, you know, we have a mismatch on margining our, our FX versus our long-term assets. And so, this is one of the... The joys of being an asset owner in Australia is that you 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 have this other giant risk that no one ever writes about. It's never in the Journal of Finance um, that you know that you have to always pay really a great deal of attention to. Well, I wanted to talk about FX only because it's something that I just always interests me, and I've grown up you know, doing a fair amount of it. Um, you know, Australia again, like the UK, has historically been a weak currency, courtesy of its deficits, inflation. It actually, the Aussie dollar looks quite cheap on a purchasing power parity versus, you know, the US, for example, sits at the epicenter of the resource, which we're going to come on to in a minute, which may be where this sort of shift in winds is going to prove to be quite helpful to the Canada's and Australia's given that. So how active do you have to be with your currency overlays and how does it actually affect or stop a decision to invest somewhere in something else? Yeah, this consumes an awful lot of my headspace and an awful lot of meeting hours amongst various team members who um, think about little else. And so the secular environment you're laying out is one that we more or less agree with, or at least agree that you should discount the probability of that at a higher level than, you know, than the previous paradigm. And and the real issue with with that, of course, which I think you're picking up on very quickly is is that that has a profound profound effects potentially on your return depending on your your choice of how much foreign currency exposure you want, but also if the correlation is shifting, if the risk correlation of the Australian dollar is shifting, then you now are essentially uh, you essentially own a very almost completely different portfolio. So a world where you have a very pro cyclical pro risk. Currency where equities fall, the Australian dollar falls, you get kind of this this free put option, exactly free, but close to free put option on your returns. It does create some interesting portfolio management issues, but it's a real buffer. Now, you have to come up with liquidity and so you have to manage that. Now, if we're going into a world where, say, the Australian dollar is more... Let's let's call it an, I don't know like a an atoms over bits world like a, a people like things a commodity super cycle mark two something like that um, and you could you can paint a picture that you know you could easily get to that assumption and you think the Australian dollar is much more correlated with things like base metals which is reasonable and empirical um, and you're going those base metals are going to stay strong sort of almost regardless of the risk environment then you don't now get that buffer you don't have provision for the liquidity. But you can't. But it's very hard to bet on that with certainty because that would, that solvency issue is so acute. So, um, so essentially, it's it's a much harder portfolio construction challenge. And I can see that the logical conclusion is it becomes a higher domestic component, given that if you want to access everything from timber to silver, you know a lot of it's on your doorstep. That's right, and so that that. We have been taking on more domestic exposure over the last few years with this recognition that 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 might be better rewarded and a better risk management practice. So I also note that recently you've gone through uh, a review of the environment, which you've been hinting at, and that you published a paper called A New Investment Order. So what came out of that as investors? Yeah, so that that was a really – it was a really fascinating process. So – um, about two th- end of, towards the end of 2019, um, we were starting to think about a couple of things. So we're starting to think about our own age. So all, all of these things I just sort of spoke about, about our formation and our history. Um, you know, we, our CEO would describe us as a teenager and we hadn't really done a very serious rethink on the way we do this. And whether it's still fit for purpose. So we wanted to completely look at the way we we invested and make sure it was, you know, we still believed in it, we we're still doing it, it was still fit for purpose. Did it need adaptation? Did it need development? 
And so, and we wanted, we, we sort of do that iteratively, but we wanted to do a proper deep dive. Um, and we also started to look at the state of the world and, and start getting a little bit concerned that things were, were shifting at the margin. And so we, we were doing, we, would, we were running exercises in 2019, which were things like, imagine, say, the world just came to a grinding halt and the Australian dollar fell to 50, 40, 30, and um, risk assets are here, and you can't communicate very easily with each other all of a sudden, and you can't be in the same room. How are we going to act? And the, the intention was to make you kind of feel what that would feel like. Now, little did we know that you know, a year later, that's exactly what would happen. And we would absolutely be feeling that, although it turns out you can't actually <laughs> feel it. And we were all we'd, all, we'd also invest in our technology as a just in case. So thank God we could actually talk to each other. We could work from home. We didn't have to scramble too hard. We're daily investment committees and all of that. Now, Melbourne, of course, were locked down for longer than any other city in the world. And so we were... Um, we had a fair bit of time in our hands, and so we thought, to hell with it, we'll we'll do this complete review of uh, the way we invest and also the state of the world. So one of the streams of work was this thing we call paradigm shifts, which was just a deep dive investigation into um, essentially the scaffolding of the world, the, the way, the rules of the game. Were they changing? And if so, why and where, they, and where might they head? And um, we essentially concluded that it was reasonable to assume that they are and that the COVID, COVID was a catalyst for this. Um, and what we thought would happen coming out of it was higher inflation, some form of deglobalization, more conflict, the, you know, the, a very profound impact of the decarbonisation movement much more fiscal empowerment, you know, um, the rising interest rates, but probably monetary being secondary to the fiscal for the first time in forever, that correlations would struggle, that commodities would come. So all of these, you know, all of these things, which, you know, kind of now seems very prescient is very much in the narrative, the everyday narrative we started talking about and writing down in 2019 and 2020 and then pushing the portfolio in that direction. Now, one of the interesting observations you made is that you don't manage the money actively in-house. You allocate to external managers. So let's just talk a little bit about how you how you identify and access <clears throat> what you term high caliber managers. I mean, everybody wants to find the good managers, but tell me a little bit about how you built your process around identification. So we have a for I mean, the formal way, which is that we talk to everyone all the time. We sit at the center of this giant expert network, essentially. We have quite specific needs often in, uh, in terms of what, what kind of active management and in what structure and in you know what vehicles or whatever is attractive to us. And that they can be quite different to other investors because of our position in the world literally our position, our currency, our size, and our constraints. And then, uh, and then, like I said, we, we have consultants and whatnot, but essentially we do most of it ourselves. We travel extensively. We talk to people every day. We try to understand what we need. And then either we go out and identify, you know, the kind of groups that, that might fit the bill or they come to us. Often they come to us, um, and increasingly, as we, you know, as we built our reputation over time, and what you realise as actually as someone as an asset owner is, I think that for a long time you think that you're the powerful person in the room and you're the one standing, the gatekeeper to all this money um, and all these potential fees, and of course uh, you are soon humbled by realising that you know, kind of. The one, the people you really want to give money to don't need that at all, and uh, it's like uh, you know, I don't know, a nightclub with a giant queue, and that queue is populated with, you know, every proverbial rich guy on earth, and <laughs> and they're all desperate to get into that door, and so actually, 
the most important thing is that you understand that you stay humble. And to me, it's like, okay, well, what on earth can I give? You know, the these potential partners, and I use that word in a very deliberate way because I think a lot of asset owners use the term partner and what they really mean is we give you fees and you do whatever the hell we ask you. And what I mean is not that. What I mean is what is it? What are comparative advantages? What view of the world do I have that I could potentially help you with? And for some, that's not much. For some, that might be just I say nice things about you and that's fine. But for others, that can be quite a lot. It can be introductions. It can be, you know, have you thought about this bit of research? Have you spoken to this person? Others are doing this kind of thing on risk management. I think you're behind. You really need to scrub up. You know, it's so you know, two-way information flow, which builds your reputation as someone sensible, helpful, and pragmatic. And ideally, what that means is then, you know, whatever, they raise the velvet rope for you and and you're able to engage in a mature two-way partnership and not, you know, and not a transactional relationship. Your other interesting factor is your geography. You sit there with the biggest sort of, you know, the biggest economic block, China, nearest to you. Um, how and not having lots of global offices, so easy to feel isolated, but but potentially quite difficult to also feel integrated into those other big capital market centers, you know, the US and, and Europe. How do you how do you think about it? Anyone who's been here will know that it's a good fifteen hours to the closest financial capital. So, to your point, look, we've made the decision that at the margin, our comparative advantage is better served by being together and being able to share information, collaborate, that the credit team are close to the private equity team, who are close to the infrastructure team, who are close to the strategy team and the economics team, the overlays team. You know, you also made because we're outsourced, we essentially have a giant global investment team. But it's an outsourced one. And so we're one step removed. Um, and and there are clear there are clear potential benefits of being you know so closer to the, to the I don't know the lifeblood of markets I guess I would argue that there are real disadvantages in terms of you you are so close that you know it, having lived in Connecticut and worked at a hedge fund and that the you can tend to become fairly reactive to the everything, like all the parties, all the information, all the hot takes, all the inside grabs. You know, it, it, it's a little bit harder to just sit back and be thoughtful about being a long-term investor, which is what we're meant to be doing. And secondly, you know, we used to at least travel a lot. We just, it was just imperative that we get on planes more than most. And so we would spend somewhere between six and depending on what asset class and what kind of person you are and what kind of work you're doing, somewhere between six and 16 weeks overseas. And I do less of that now when there's more of this and that, you know, that, and that makes life a bit easier. But, but we still, you know, we still end up being on planes quite a lot. Yeah. Well, as I said before, I just thought I ran into Caroline Kay, who's one of your senior advisors, who happens to be, you know, also connected as a senior advisor with Rothschild, where, where I do some some work as well. And it was very interesting, just sort of, you know, they're sitting in Switzerland having this meeting. Um, it didn't feel, you know, it was very, uh, you know, alien or far away at all. But the, I guess the the onus is on you folks to, you know, to travel more because that's just the way, you know, the way it goes. Now, um, we've talked about how you build the portfolio. Uh, and what, what we really wanted to also get a sense of in all these interviews with the sovereign wealth funds is agility, flexibility, i.e., you know, some of these, well, they are all huge pools of capital. I mean, my goodness me, you know, these are all vast pools. Um, and that can be an enemy of mobility and, and, and flexibility, but it need not be. How do you as a, as a group think about times when you want to do, you know, make bigger moves? I think we are all passionate and always have been passionate that we would never lose an investment opportunity due to the stickiness of our governance. And so we have managed to display really efficient and effective and professional 
uh, decision-making and governance really since inception. It really started with uh, we got we got a large check in 2007 and we started investing and we had a consultant and uh, that consultant was telling us to get invested and start you know putting it in passive equities or or, or whatever and we started down that process um, and then abruptly stopped on the advice of the investment committee and the head of strategy at the time who thought that. There was something that we weren't getting well well rewarded for taking that risk, and the consultant pushed against us, and ultimately we went up to the board of guardians, where Caroline is now a member, and um and they supported the management team and allowed us to stop investing, and we we sat in cash for a little while, and then the world changed, obviously, and that became an amazing decision, and that saved us a lot of money, and really embedded this idea that we would never be beholden. Um, to benchmarks and as you were investing um, and has been quite a seminal part of our culture. And so, you know, that flows through today. We have a very, very professional and extraordinarily commercial and good legal team and tax team and operations team and, 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 and you know, all the implementation teams that are extraordinarily diligent and professional and reactive and commercial. Um, and essentially, uh, you know, we are able to make decisions really flexible in a really flexible way, in a really responsive way, in really significant size. So I'll give you a semi-specific example. During the COVID experience, we, we, we started having daily investment committee meetings um, over it was over Skype at the time. Now we have better stuff now. Um, and uh, we had several opportunities, obviously. Like, what's our what's our function as an asset owner? Really, it's to, we're going to make the most money when we are providing stopgap liquidity into an environment where price discovery is really, really difficult. That's ultimately our function in the capital market system. And so that's what we should be very clear-headed about. Um, but to your point, you have to be able to do it. You have to be able to re- react to it. You have to have buy-in. And so in the midst of those daily RC meetings when we're defending the portfolio and you know, obviously losing billions of dollars every day and it's very stressful, we were actually also able to invest in very large size into vehicles that were raised kind of over the weekend. We were invested, you know, we we had IC on Friday, we we're invested on Monday. Um, we're able to diligence tax, you know, the, the whole thing. And and this this is one of the other ways that you can, you know, be helpful to your partners um, by being able to provide capital, by being able to understand the opportunity, by being able to diligence, by working the extra hours, by getting up at three o'clock in the morning if you have to, to be on the calls to understand the opportunity set and then relaying it to your own IC at six o'clock in the morning and then having it, you know, setting the wheels in motion to get invested. So we're very passionate about that. I think we've done that extremely well. One of the challenges that you, um, I think you've answered, but we've again wanted to talk to all of these organizations about, which is talent and retention of talent. Now, it does seem that you're all incentivized, just, you know, within what you can talk about. You're still there. You've been there a long time. How have... How have smart people been persuaded to stay working for a government entity? Yeah, it's, so that's a good question. When we ask ourselves a lot, um, and <laughs> uh, and the truth is that we don't hold on to everyone, obviously, but we hold on to. We actually have a pretty low low turnover. Um, so I think, I mean, personally, I can answer for myself, and then you know more broadly for the. I think for the organisation, there, there's a really terrific purpose. All right, so you know every every one percent in extra returns I can make is you know give or take two billion dollars, and actually that that buys a lot of stuff. That's twenty thirty thousand teachers' salaries if I do my job well. Um, you know that that that's that's incredibly meaningful. That that's most of a research hospital. It's a you know it's a train station, right? And so there's a tangible impact in what we do that's very clear and purposeful and meaningful and it's not muddied kind of and so so that's very important we also have one client 
or we have 30 million, but we don't see them. And so we, we only invest for, for investment returns. We don't raise money. We don't, you know, run around trying to convince people that, that, you know, we're slightly better than the next guy because we did half a percent better with a half a percent lower vol or whatever. Like, that's not our job. That's really not our job. It's incredibly pure. We get to think about investing. That's what we do. We, like I said, we sit in this middle of this wonderful expert network. We talk to all the most interesting people in the world. We have all the access and we try to do our best to put all of that information together to go a little bit better for everyone of our neighbors. That, that is actually really powerful and really cool. And if you can't get up in the morning for that, then, you know, then don't work here. That's fine. The last investment question comes back to ESG. There is a backlash, which isn't entirely surprising given how euphoric and how commercial much of the investment industry has been. Uh, there's a chap we do know well. Um, he ha- happens to be ex-Gold, was called Bruno de Kegel, who founded Arvella Investments. And he said, given the current ESG backlash, uh, they have long argued that allocating capital based on ESG scores and exclusions is a flawed investment concept. And he asks, as stewards of long-term capital, how do you or your third-party managers engage portfolio firms on ESG sustainability with a view to unlock financial value? Yeah. So, look, we generally don't exclude. Um, we believe this isn't like, so ESG is a broad thing, obviously. So, the go- governance is is br- incredibly important. You struggle to find anyone who argues the other side of that. I mean, obviously, it's important. It's a quality factor. Basic diligence should allow you to overweight things that are governed well. The sustainability environment, um, you know, this is this is the biggest capital event of our lifetime. Uh, it's the first time we've retired an enormous amount of operating capital stock that works incredibly well for the sake of the externalities, and we're going to replace it with stuff that possibly doesn't work as well. That's an enormous event. Uh, it's the world's, you know, biggest challenge. It's the world's biggest capital movement. It's going to impact our portfolios and the way we invest for the rest of my life. So we think we also believe that the biggest impact we can have is via our influence, is via our ownership, is via our active ownership, is via speaking to, you know, to the appropriate stakeholders, um, and that's been our approach. And sitting there. With China on your doorstep, albeit a long way away, um, there have been more tensions because of you know, the philosophical perspective of the Chinese versus the West. How would you describe your sort of the investing lens that you use with China? Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, this is central to this sort of disentangling, deglobalizing um, world. It's, you know, variously described. Uh, it's a great power competition. I mean, I think the US themselves describe it as some form of intense competition. Jake Sullivan said that just the other day. So, um, the so that's look, that's important. That, that that's that's a crucial change. I mean, I think that the world has gone from mutually assured destruction to we'll wrap ourselves in diamond encrusted golden handcuffs, and so we'll never be able to punch each other in the face. And now to something else. And we don't exactly know what that something else is. And at times, I'm sure it will look fine. And at times, it will look less fine. And, and But th- th- this adds a risk premium, essentially, um, to, to all our investing. Um, and so we work hard to try to understand that risk premium. And if we are better rewarded for taking on that risk, if that's unpriced somewhere versus... Um, you know, the stock of global things that we can invest into, then, then we'll take that into account. We know that this can be at times a really tough business. And when investment performance is not your friend, tell me a little bit about how you deal with it, you know, emotionally and how as a team you respond to it, particularly when you might have parts of the team that are feeling slightly more pleased with themselves. Yeah, it's that's... um. A good question. It's obviously something we've been living um, 
and I suspect we'll be living more of. I mean, I deal with it by – I mean, there's sort of two ways. There's the, the, the how do I get up in the morning way, and that's, I think, I, like I was implying earlier, more interesting. And we can add more value if we get things more right. And so that is an enormously driving, motivating force for me. And so, you know, without the, the risk of annoying people, like I proverbially jump up out of my bed in the morning and think, okay, how can I do this a bit better today? Um, and so that, so personal motivation is not a problem at all. The, um, the, it's something I really enjoyed that, is 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 a is a value of the fund and that that I've heard from very early on since getting there was that some version of it's okay to fail but let make sure you fail thoughtfully and we will embrace thoughtful failure which I think is reasonably profound because it means a take some risks we'll support you we own them together make sure they're well reasoned risks <laughs> and then learn from them if you if they if they don't work. Um, more volatility means more things won't work. And, you know, th there's a kind of a, a very close relationship between those two. But if we stop taking risks, then for sure we're not going to get anywhere near, you know, meeting our mandate or anywhere near adding the kind of value that we want to add. And, you know, adding that value is really important and it's substantial and it does you know, important things for for the country. So, um, so I don't know. That's not. I don't find motivation hard. Okay, and when and when you leap out of bed in the morning, enthusiastically embracing this new world order, um, what's the what's the one or two skills that you would like to add to your war chest personally? Oh man, Just like getting older. So uh, I, I once upon a time would have loved to have been able to, you know, run three minute kilometers and uh, and swim properly and and all of that. Um, uh, my dreams of any of that are long gone, unfortunately. Um, really, this is possibly a very boring answer, but the um, we live at the other end of a fire hose of information. Um, so I do jump up every morning and every morning my inbox is populated with hundreds and hundreds of, of messages and, and many of them, more than not, are interesting and they contain some nugget of information. Um, and But I only have 24 hours and I have, you know, 45-odd people directly and 350-odd indirectly who I feel very responsible for and then my own family and then 30 million other people. So um, so deciding how to use my time is obviously extremely important. And I think earlier on in my career and life, I would have spent more of it doing the interesting things without, without really making the connection between, okay, this is, I enjoy this, but is there really a point to this? <laughs> is it the best use of my time? Where is this going? So I, I definitely um, have had to develop more discipline around that. And I think that's a lifelong thing that I hope to continue to get better at. <laughs> yeah, look, it's absolutely right. It's a huge challenge for us all. I watched uh, two nights ago on Netflix this new new documentary called The Race of the Century. I don't know whether you've seen it, but it is the America's Cup 1983. It's Australia's great challenge, challenge on that sort of that bastion of, un, of, of you know, of invincibility, the uh, US Yachting Club. Uh, it's absolutely fantastic, the race of the century. So there you go. I'm not an agent for Netflix, but I was captivated, you know, by that. Well, look, you have got another 150 emails that you probably still need to go through. It's the end of your day. I've taken up nearly an hour of your time and we really, really appreciate it. And this has been, again, very different interview because you've given us lots of things to think about. If I was summarizing, maybe two things that struck me in this conversation is that, again, unlike many, your sort of the corporate ethos is that being together is a corporate advantage. And I think that runs against the that runs against the tide of you know global footprint firms with local expertise, and I like it because you know it's probably Australia's the the place you'd least expect to find you know that as a core 
core beliefs and that I'm going to take that with me. Um, and look, I think that you've hinted at and and well, more than that, I'm going to say that again. You've you've elaborated on the fact that this could be a new investment order. The world's disentangling, but the things that won in the previous 15 years with super cheap money are unlikely to be the winners, which does mean that your portfolio is going to have you know, different components, whether that is, you know, higher commodity, you know, components or, you know, even a different thinking around currencies. And I'm not sure that, you know, that that's being embraced in lots of quarters where, you know, where uh, I sort of you know, travel and observe. So, um, Ben, it's fantastic to be speaking to you, you know, on the other side of the world. Um, hopefully the communications will have worked, you know, and this will be um, a flawless production on YouTube and on uh, and on the audio channels. And very much look forward to meeting you in person on one of your trips. Um, so thank you so much for being with us today. Absolute pleasure, Simon. And well done on the success of this podcast. It's quite the uh, array of luminaries you have on your website there. It's uh, very intimidating. <laughs> Uh, well, fantastic. Well, thank you very much.